Hi, this is Chris Irving, comic book professor at Virginia Commonwealth University and maker of all things Madman with Mike Allred. You are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a multi-talented individual. He is an, an author, a comic historian. He's a professor at a university. He has done so many things with so many projects upcoming. And we have a short amount of time with him today. We're joined today by the ever-talented Chris Irving. How are you doing today, Chris? Hey, yeah, I'm doing really well. How are you, Kurt? The reason why I haven't brought up the projects you have ongoing is because you have many prog projects on the go currently. And I'd like you to let us know, in, in your upcoming months here, what, what are you currently working on and, and what do you have in the future, first off? Yeah. I'll try and keep it brief. Yeah, so as far as creative projects on May 15th, Mike Allred Mod Metal Lunchbox on Kickstarter. Uh, it will be the first Madman Metal Lunchbox in 20 years. Original and new art by Mike and Laura Allred featuring um, the madman verse of characters. So it's Madman, It Girl, uh, Mott, Red Rocket 7's on there, X-Ray Robot, The Atomics. Uh, me and Mike have been talking about it for maybe about two years, but he's <laughs> he's honestly been too darn busy to get to it sooner because it's it's a lot of work. You know, it's a fully color original art. So that launches May 15th, um, and it will be a 45-day campaign on Kickstarter. And we are super excited for that. You know, we just wrapped the Mad Mania, Saturday Morning Mad Mania, which we did through Kickstarter. And it's basically a cereal box with um, nothing but prizes inside. So, you know, backers got like a, they actually got a whoopee cushion with the puke on it, Meh. which I'm incredibly proud of. We also got some Dunkin' Yo-Yos. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the uh, Dr. Flum Yo-Yo. The Mod Metal Lunchbox is kind of the latest in um, all of the crazy Mad Maniverse stuff that I've been making with Mike. So we're super excited for it. Uh, it's also going to come with the, uh, we call it the Lunchtime Digest, which is a 64-page color digest of Madman Comics. The main cover is going to be by Mike, but the alternate cover is going to be by Dan Parent, who's, you know, as we know, like kind of the head artist at Archie Comics, creator of Die Kitty Die, of course, Kevin Keller at Archie. And TV Zone, Dan Parent, because he was just on a game show. So it's going to be really exciting. We're super, super stoked for it. Now launching around June 1st, uh, give or take, mm -hmm. I'm still working on it. We're launching the Will Eisner, A Life in Postcard series. I'm doing that with Dennis Kitchen and the Will Eisner estate. And it'll be a set of about 52 um, vintage size and style postcards featuring um, photos and artwork um, by Will Eisner. It's also going to have some quotes, original quotes from different creators. I have Mark Wade has contributed one, um, Paul Levitz as well. I got a really great quote from Neil Gaiman, um, which I was super, I was stoked to get all of them, but it's always cool when you can score something um, that Neil's had a hand in. So that's going to launch around early June. I just got like a really nice big artwork dump in my inbox that I'm sorting through right now. I'm kind of trying to get through the next few weeks of the semester slash survive the semester. It's mid-April, you know, as we're doing this. Those are the big ones, <laughs> you know, first and forefront. Um, I am putting the finishing touches on uh, the book on movie serials featuring superheroes. Uh, that's gonna be for two morrows. Um, I'm putting the finishing touches on that on top of everything else. That'll probably not come out till next year or so. Now, looking at yourself as a creative person, what was your first foray into being creative? When I was uh, when I was a kid, uh, we had a book contest at my school, and I did a book of fables, but I <laughs> I made them like small paperback size. <laughs> like I have a you know like a small paperback here, and so I sat there and I cut the pages to like that dimension. Um, that's one of the first things I remember, but as far as I know, I was always kind of a creative kid. I always made stuff. As a creative person that you are and the multiple areas that you, you are working in, is the hardest part the beginning, the middle, or the end of a, of a project? Well, the beginning is always the exciting part for me. 
because that's when the ideas are really I dislike the end part in that the end part is where you have to kind of kill your darlings. You know, you have to sacrifice some pieces. But ultimately, if, if I can push that forward, the like far end, right? When you look back in retrospect, that can sometimes be the toughest. You know, I'm very happy with all the madman stuff I've done with Mike. But as far as books go, you know, I've got a couple of books that I'm still proud of, but I still kind of look back and I'm like, what if I could have done, you know, leaping tall buildings when crowdfunding was really a thing? We could have done it our own way. And I think it would have been a better project than, or product, I should say, than what was made. But then I look at the Blue Beetle Companion, which I'm still like immensely proud of. And like, it's just about Dan. The experience was so perfect making that, that I can't think of anything I'd do differently with it. You have a bit of Marvel behind you there uh, mm -hmm. in terms of comics itself. Uh, as a professor of, of comics history, of course, that is one of your professions as well, too. One of them, yeah. Uh, one of the many. <laughs> what have you learned in your years of teaching that has made you excited about the upcoming generation of creative people? Um, I would say their perspective. I, I say this all the time. They're always teaching me new things. And I embrace their ability to challenge material that we look at because they see it through a completely different lens. So getting that fresh perspective on something that I've known for decades is wonderful. Uh, best example in comic book history, in my comic book history class years ago, I showed the cover to Action Comics number one. And one of the students pointed out, hey, you know, no one knows that Superman when it came out. So he just looks like some asshole wrecking someone's car. And uh, I was like, oh my God, that's, I never thought of it that way. Cause I always looked at it with this bias of, oh, it's Superman and he's, you know, beating the bad guys. But, but yeah, you get really great moments like that, especially when you show comics from the nineties. That's, that's a fun lesson. So in, in looking at the, the history of comics that you, you have, especially with what Will Eisner has, has mm -hmm. created in, in his time, you know, why was it important for you to to work on the Will Eisner project? Because I met Will a few times and he was always really kind to me. He would send me a note. I gave him my first comic that I ever did and he sent me a note. I mean, it wasn't ready for prime time as he put it, but the fact that he took five minutes to do something to kind of encourage a 22 year old kid really meant a lot. I love Will's work. The times I, I worked with Will, I really enjoyed, or you know, through interviews or I met him. He's always very generous. And that goes a really long ways with me. Um, also, it's a chance to work with Dennis Kitchen again. And Dennis has, whether he likes it or not, been a real role model to me. I, I really look to Dennis as a publisher and as a historian and honestly as a human being. Um, and I learned so much from him. So it's for me, it's a no-brainer. Um, I did the spirit trading cards about four years ago, maybe. And it was such a lovely experience. Um, <laughs> A busy experience. I had to recolor all of Will Eisner's spirit artwork myself. Well, I, I had my friend Aaron uh, helped too, um, but it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And it was an honor to work on anything associated with Will. With the Madman Mod Metal lunchbox, that, yeah. that is still a mouthful. <laughs> you know, what is it about that, the art style and the, the history of that series that because this is the first I've heard of it myself, as a even as a geek that I am. Well, wait, of Madman. Yes. Yeah. Oh is. my god. I know. I, oh my I'm, god. I'm, I'll try, but I'm sorry. Well, I don't believe in the whole geek label. Nothing personal. No, but funny. I'm a connoisseur of this stuff. Um, I've been writing these things called Mad Mania, and I'll send you some copies. Just get me an address. Oh, yeah. Which each one is like uh, just kind of my personal and critical reflections of the madman run through the 90s madman is the first comic book that i read that told me that superheroes can be different and weird and quirky and they can be brilliant they can be existentialist they can be intellectual they can be thought-provoking um at a level i'd never seen anywhere else so madman is really where mike allred became mike allred that we know now um you know through his work on silver surfer or um his upcoming Superman graphic novel series with the 380 pagers. So for me, Madman was such uh, an important book in who I am and my development as, uh, as a human being, honestly. And then as far as working in comics, um, Mike was one of the first people I ever interviewed. And the term mod metal actually comes from 
the first interview I did with him in 1997. He used that term to describe his uh, rock and roll comic book, Red Rocket 7. Um, so I, I would say like kind of a plug for Dark Horse. Dark Horse has been doing these really beautiful, they're pricey, but they're well worth the money, hardcovers of Madman um, collecting everything. Uh, he's also going to collect some of his pre-Madman work in here too, I believe. Those have been pretty phenomenal. So for me, it's, you know, it's just what I love. My kid... My kid loves Madman now. Uh, he's four, so it's it's kind of a cool thing to to be able to share with him. So, what is your creative kryptonite? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would probably say, God, I mean, I, that it's just because I, I do so many different things. You know, I guess it depends on the project. You know, uh, I, I would say, like in terms of like the Kickstarter stuff, sometimes fulfilling. Mm. Um, but that's just because it's it, it's why we're at this angle because the rest of my office is a disaster right now. Just actually having to do that physically on top of everything else can be a real a real pain in the keister. That's a good question. Again, I guess it depends on the project. Um, probably dealing with difficult people, you know, having to wait for permission. Uh, it's one of the things I faced when whenever I write a book, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I love the ability to self publish and just. You know, I want to do Mad Mania, I can do Mad Mania. Mike gives me permission. He's um, really generous and, and awesome to work with. Um, but like when we did Leaping Tall Buildings, like we had an agent and it had to be shopped around. And um, that part was a real pain in the ass. And then, you know, you had a publisher who really didn't get it. And then you have to deal, you're kind of at the mercy of a publisher who's just clueless um, when it comes to uh, marketing, you know, comics history, I'm okay with res limitations because I find those challenging and engaging. I get really irritated when I have the level of success I want is disrupted by one person who just doesn't and doesn't get that they don't get it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think the best thing we can ever do as collaborators, it's been a hard lesson for me, but the best thing we can ever do is acknowledge when we don't understand something. And when we're out of our, kind of out of our depth or our wheelhouse, because that's really what we have other people for, right? You know, otherwise, what's the point? Let everyone else do the hard work, you know? Yeah, yeah that's it. That's it. Better. You know what? I mean, yeah, let them do it all. You know, just kind of sit back and get all the cash money and the royalties and the fame. You know, I mean, it's how I'm building my Kickstarter empire. Like I put my kid to work. He does all of the packing. He's four. You know, I mean. What the hell? He's got to earn his keep somehow. Exactly. I mean, he's soon he'll be cutting the lawn and asking for the car, but let him work, you know, in yeah. his early stage. So. Yeah, someone's got to do it. I don't yeah. care. Oh, daddy, I'm tired. Oh, daddy, I can't read yet for to put the address <laughs> labels on. I don't care. I got everyone's money. We'll send it out. It'll be fine. I'm sure Mrs. Smith down the road will enjoy the 60 copies of the comics that she just wants. <laughs> <laughs> yes. She's, she's my biggest fan, actually. <laughs> Um, Whether she wants to or not, yeah. <laughs> my, my partner might get really irritated at that. Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Smith is, you know. Being that you've been in so many different areas and also that you are a professor as well, too, when was the first experience where you learned that language had power? Oh. Um, that is a really tough question. Language had power. I'm not really sure because I feel a lot of people use language as a bludgeon. Um, like if, oh, you, you've got one word off, wait, that's your intent. You know, I do feel like people abuse language quite a bit. I would say language that affected me the most was reading, um, if by Rudyard Kipling in secret origins, annual number two by William Mesmer Loeb's. It was a uh, Wally West story. I got it out of like a 50 cent box at a convention in the late eighties. And it was all about Wally coming to terms with Barry's death. And that poem is printed right in, in, in the last page. Uh, I don't like poetry. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> not a fan. Uh, but that poem, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 se seconds worth of distance run, um, that, that poem just totally floored me. Um, it's the only poem I love. So I would probably say that. Coupled with, you know, listening to, to The Cure and really starting to, to dive into the lyrics. Same with the Smiths as well. I mean, Morrissey got some of Morrissey's lyrics were just uh, mm -hmm. just amazing. Josh Ritter, I mean, his his lyrics are 
he, he wrote the greatest breakup album ever made in um what is it beast i can't remember the name of it but it's, it's a great breakup album in your opinion what is the most important quality of a writer in today's comics and how does that translate to your own work yeah well i mean like the most important quality of a writer is i think to really sum up a character in a caption box or a dialogue a word balloon uh, I think Tom King has that in spades. Um, I'm constantly reading Human Target and just getting <laughs> kind of pissed off at what a great writer he is. Because he has this like one caption where he describes Ted Cord, you know, who's very near and dear to me as, as a fan. Mm -hmm. um, and, but he just nails it. You know, like he just he gets it. You know, I think Jeff Chons has said as well. I think Jeff uh, Doomsday Clock was just uh, a surprisingly great book. And he has those moments where he really captures like who Superman is in one statement. And I, I think the ability uh, to have that type of brevity and really sum up a character reminds us, of, reminds us of, as far as superheroes go, how iconic the best heroes are, right? They're so iconic. One, one word balloon or one caption really tells you everything you need. What's your most favorite underappreciated comic book or novel that maybe people haven't heard of? Hmm. Man, it's, that's a good, uh, good question. I mean, comics, I can, I can tell you a bunch of obscure old stuff. I would say Death Patrol by Jack Cole is probably my favorite um, it's based, it's, it's World War II era and they're basically, it's like Suicide Squad before Suicide Squad. They took all of these like prisoners and they give them a chance to get out of prison if they like fight a war. Uh, and so they're all aviators and, and they wear like, you know, kind of the striped prisoner's outfit, the black and white striped. And I think they have number plates on their chest. Um, but like they'll kill characters off like every story. That's the whole point. And it's way ahead of its time, and it's Jack Cole, so it's brilliant. Uh, but Death Patrol is what I would highly, I would probably, that's the first one that comes to mind. I, I, there, I have more, but I would need to dig for them. Definitely send me the Kickstarter information once that all goes live, and I'll, and I'll put it up as the interview is playing. Uh, and, well. and I will tell you, I link all of the Kickstarters at thedrawnword.com. It's T-H-E-D-R-A-W-N-W-O-R-D. I find that I just, you know, I put an image that you click and it'll take you straight there. It makes it a lot easier for, um, like when I put it on Instagram, I could just put my URL in an image and it's not like a weird Kickstarter URL. It's just a very direct, short, little blurb. Um, but yeah, they will be there and I will send you the direct links, definitely. At what point are we good enough? When we recognize that we're never going to be good enough. You know, it's just kind of that moment we, you know, we can appreciate how good we are. I never trust anyone who says they're great, you know, especially as far as talent. They're like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm great. Like, I, <laughs> I, I'm at, at the height of my abilities uh, because that's someone who refuses to grow. So we never really creatively want to feel good enough because the minute we feel from that perspective of like the, the craft, um, when we feel good enough, that's when we stop growing. That's when we stop pushing ourselves. But I think we also have to temper that with a recognition that, you know, okay, well, maybe things could be better. Maybe I can, I can massage this line of dialogue a, a seventh or eighth time, or maybe I can rework this design I did again. Um, but, you know, I have a deadline and I need to move on to something else or I'm going to drive myself crazy. So this is as good as it's going to get right now. And I have to accept that. And to me, that acceptance is what makes us really good. The ability to just kind of look at the fact that we are, we are limited. We are limited as human beings in our abilities. What is the second wisest thing someone's ever said to you that has stuck with you in your career? <laughs> There was something that happened years ago where someone was really putting themselves out there and I think exploiting, I felt they were exploiting the relationship with uh, someone who was no longer around. And I was pissed about it. 
um, because I felt like they were weekend at, doing like a weekend at Bernie's <laughs> with this person's memory. Like, see, I was their buddy. I was their, you know, I was their, uh, that person can rot in hell as far as I'm concerned. And you can, well, you're quoting me because it's video. Um, but I, I was really upset about it. Uh, and I was telling someone who is far wiser than I am and has been in comics way longer than, and has been in comics proper, you know, I consider myself kind of like a satellite to the comics industry because I, I, you know, I work with creators uh, at conventions and I've interviewed dozens upon dozens over the years and I've written books, but I'm not like kind of in it, you know, but this person who's been in it for years and is a no bullshit human being said, well, yeah, but you know, you, you could, you could say, call it out, but then people would say you're being the asshole. Um, and I, I think that was um, such a wonderful thing that was said to me because it's like, okay. And again, this, this, this creator has like no bullshit about him, which is why I admire him and, and, and truly love this guy. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, he was right. You know, sometimes you have to just, you know, kind of let people be the real assholes and um, accept that you know, other people are going to see them for who and what they are. Because when you start calling them out, then given this situation, because this person hadn't been gone for very long and people are going to be assholes and you just have to kind of accept that, you know, and, and not let that affect you. Karma's a bitch too. So it works out. Yeah, it, it is. It, it really is. One really wise thing I, I can, I can quote all of this because these people are sadly no longer with us. I was talking about Robert Kaniger. I just interviewed Robert Kaniger, who is the meanest son of a bitch in comics. <laughs> I mean that with affection okay. and he knew it. And it was a great interview because I was very polite. I found that like, if I kept being polite, it would set him off and he would not shut up for another 25 minutes. <laughs> and I love Robert Kaniger. I admire Kaniger. He's one of my favorite sixties writers. And I think he did, you know, he wrote poems and, brought that into comic book storytelling. Um, and I think that some of the, the, the tempo, kind of the tempo and like some of his Sergeant Rock stories that he created with Joe Kubert are breathtaking. But he was, he was really <laughs> kind of this verbally abusive, cranky old guy. And I loved it. It was great. But he also really would like, somehow he came into conversation, was talking to Dick Giordano. Um, and Dick was uh, such a lovely human being and he was so kind and he was so, um, again, I keep using the word generous, but he was. Dick, Dick Giordano was just, um, he, he was one of the best, right? And Dick said, well, you know, that's an example of the people you step on on the way up are going to be there when they watch you on the way down fall they're going to be able to watch you fall on the way down and that's something i never forgot because i, I it's again it's a karma is a bitch thing but i've seen it happen you know um so when i when i see people who are stepping on others toes because they're ambitious it catches up to them because you know what you are going to be forced at one point to either need that person for help or you are going to depend on that person to help you out of the hole you've dug for yourself and fallen in, you know, and folks like that, you can't always feel bad for, you know? Yeah. I got tired of the, uh, the old questions I used to ask that just felt canned. And I was like, you know what? I need something fresh. So about three years ago, I started yeah. re researching interview questions for entertainment and this is what I've come up with. And I've been putting together a documentary for the past 10 or so years, interviewing creative people in the entertainment industry. Um, some are with us, some are not, called Little Person Amongst Media Giants. And That's these great. last four questions are part of it. So I got to interview um, uh, Tom Holland, who did not the actor, but oh, I was going to say, no, no, but just as good, the uh, writer director of Fright Night. Oh, yeah. I've gotten to know him pretty well. And he's a delightful interview. Um, and, and he's, I'm trying to convince him to start like he, he keeps getting interview requests and he's like, I'm, he's trying to get these prequel novels done to Fright Night called Fright Night Origins. So I think he's, um, he's trying to time it all with, with when, when he gets those, you know, coming out. 
but he was a delightful guy to speak with. And I'm like, Tom, you've, you've got to do conventions. Like, even if you do like just, you know, stuff like this zoom chat, yeah. he's such a delightful, delightful guy. And he's, uh, he also directed child's play. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's... Um, but yeah, he's, I, I really, really enjoy him. Um, so yeah, it's, it's cool when you get to talk to these folks who are, who have done one thing in their lives that affected everyone else. Trendsetters. I mean, they, they, at the time they didn't realize it, but they, they've inspired generations, which yeah. ironically is part of one of my questions, but um, <laughs> let's get into these last four here. Please, um, can't be any worse than what you've already answered, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, you should see some of the questions I get from students. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty open with my kids. I don't believe in bullshitting. I believe in being as, as honest as I can because that makes it easier to be honest about the work we talk about, the comics and the, the movies and TV. Oh. But sometimes I get questions that are real zingers, so it can't be worse. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? My dad. My father, who's no longer with me. My dad became a small-town radio disc jockey at the age of 40. And he had, he'd wanted to always work in radio and he never sat down and said, son, <laughs> you have to do what you love. He showed me instead, he modeled it and he always supported me. Um, but he didn't always get it. You know, my favorite Elliot Irvin quote was son, I don't fully understand what it is you do, but I'm proud of you for it. And, and kind of that honesty, that honesty with me and with himself, that love of the work he did in radio, where he actually interviewed people as well for a, a, their call-in show, Call Flow. He also did a show on called The Swinging Years on big band music, which he had to learn about for it because he was mostly like a 50s, 60s rock and roll guy. And he did the news in all of the small towns. When he died, they had to hire three people to replace him. So maybe I, I became a workaholic from my dad, too, I guess. But uh, my, my father, hands down. A lot of people have helped me along the way, but he's, he's the one who um, helped me the most. And he's the one who I, I really wish could see all of the cool things I've been able to, to get done. Yeah, he's looking up. And um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that caught me off guard. Wow. <laughs> well, that's why it's funny. No, my my dad, my I'm sure my dad is is well aware, and um, and I'm proud of him. From a professional perspective, you have done extremely well in every single project that you've done, as well as the fact that you are a professor teaching the next generation of amazing, talented people of the history of comics. So professionally, you are successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Well, thanks. I would consider myself personally successful, um, except when keeping my four-year-old out of the room. Hey, Gray. But the timing is actually perfect because, um, okay, this little boy, and it's okay. You can put him on if you want yeah. to. Grayson is why I'm personally successful. But yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say all of my creative work has been quite as successful as, oh, you have to measure success, right? Mm. And I think just getting stuff done is in itself enough of a measure of success. But, you know, there's also the measure of like, are more people backing my projects or more people reading my books? You know, but for me, like this, a lot of the success comes from the fact that, you know, I have students. I have, I have one student, Hunter, is now uh, sculpting action figures for McFarland Toys, oh, wow. you know? And the fact that like... You know, I, I have this kid doing one of my students doing all these amazing things and still like shooting me an email. I just saw him yesterday. That to me tells me I succeeded in, in some little small way. The fact that I have a really smart kid who uh, doesn't listen to his dad. <laughs> so, yes, that's that's kind of the the short answer. Yeah. So he's he's also the one of the reasons I do a lot of these these things in all honesty the madman toys have been i make a lot of the madman stuff for him actually you know like he loves whoopee cushions that's part of why we have a puke whoopee cushion um and he goes to kindergarten next fall so the madman mod metal lunchbox 
should be ready for him. Hey, am um, I five now? No, you're not five yet. You're not five till the end of June. Um, so the Mod Metal Lunchbox should be ready um, halfway through his kindergarten year. And, and I'm going to save extras so that he has one for every year, even in high school, whether he wants it or not. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, collectibles. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? <laughs> <laughs> failure is basically success that's still cooking, right? If I'm smart, I'm going to look at something not working, and then I'm going to find a way in which I can succeed in that way. Okay, great. There you go. Like, for instance, I, you know, I had something happen in one of my classes without going super into detail, where like a certain lesson didn't go over as well as I'd hoped. So I, I realized kind of pretty quickly that something wasn't working with that lesson, right? And I could have gone one of two ways. I could have said, oh my gosh, I failed the lesson. I failed my students. I failed my vocation. I failed my father. I failed everything. I'm just going to give up now. Instead, I decided that I would find ways to succeed over how I failed on that one lesson. It sent me on kind of a really long path of self-reflection um, also of, you know, researching and talking with other professors and, and other um, people in the field. I like to think I've succeeded pretty well from there. But really, anytime someone just goes sour grapes over something that didn't work out, then they just have no business doing whatever it is they're doing, right? Whether it's, you know, creating comics or creating, you know, crazy stuff for someone's shelf, writing a book, like if they're just going to give up because one thing didn't work out, then they're probably not in the right field to begin with. And they need to rethink that. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you currently, he's going to be inspired to be creative in some way, shape or form. I hope so. Thanks. <laughs> How can they inspire the generation that follows them? That, that's a really good question. Uh, I think that's up to him. You know, um, my, my father wrote a book on, so I'm, I'm in, well, I, I grew up around Richmond, Virginia mm -hmm. and the, uh, Atlanta Braves had a farm team called the Richmond Braves. Mm -hmm. And before the Richmond Braves, um, there was the Richmond Virginians. And so my dad wrote this, this book about the Virginians. And, uh, I remember seeing him sit there with his self-published book. He had this like black tape that you would you would moisten, and it was like a spine tape thing. This was you know this was just like done at a local printer and everything, but it inspired me um, that you know I can sit down and I can make something. My dad never sat down and said you can make something, Chris. You know, so in the case of Grayson, um, I like to I like for him to know that he can just make whatever he wants. We make yo-yos, we make action figures, because we've got the Madman action figure, thanks to my friend Bill Murphy. Um, I might have some more figures in my future, um, but I also want to kind of share these things with Gray. One of the other things I do is um, I moderate for GalaxyCon, and I love the GalaxyCon. Um, so Mike Broder owns it, he does, um, it's a traveling show, um, and they happen to do a Richmond show, which is kind of convenient. Can you tell Mr. Kurt who you met at GalaxyCon? I mean Wonder Girl. He met Wonder Girl. Oh, wow. He he met Connor, who plays Wonder Girl. On. Can you tell me what you and Wonder Girl did? We hanged out. You hanged out. You hanged out in the green room, um, but you did also get, like, your picture with her and an autograph. What type of person was Wonder Girl? Can you tell Daddy? A superhero. She's a superhero. And was she nice? She was super nice. The fact that I could share that with my very sweet, very hyper son uh, was wonderful. And so I hope that inspires him to know that, you know, just because someone's on TV, they're, you know, they're people too. And by the way, uh, if you guys ever get to meet Connor Leslie, she's super kind and she's, she was just engaged with Grayson and she was the nicest person. Um, so if you ever see her at a show, get an autograph, really Get, get a picture. She's, she's lovely. Just like one of the nicest people I've ever met. But, you know, my dad set the example that you can just do something. You don't have to wait for someone. And uh, I'm trying to do that for him as well. We all have kids. So, you know, we don't, we don't apologize for him and we don't apologize for him to be parents, you know? 
Oh, well, I do hate to say this, though, Chris, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. <laughs> I want to thank you both for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate well, thank it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grayson. Can, can you say thank you, Mr. Kurt? I'm sorry for interrupting. Thank you. I'm sorry for interrupting. It's all okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. Can, can you say, say bye-bye to everyone? Bye bye. Okay, thank bye you so bye much, bye Kurt. Bye this bye was bye. fun. And uh, next time, I'm going to do this from my office on campus, 20 miles away. I want to thank you for taking the time to be on this interview of Two Geeks Talking. You can find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, twogeekstalking.com or tgtmedia.com, and on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on. Two Geeks Talking.